millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. We live in a noisy world. There's noise on social media, noise on TV, noise at work, and certainly noise in the investing world. And I have to admit, it's hard to know what to pay attention to, let alone what to invest in and when. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. There are those people you meet and you just want to sit with them forever and pick their brain. Our podcast, Mish, is definitely one of those people for me. I felt like we were instant BFFs and I could have chatted forever with her because she is the real deal. She made her way onto the investing floor in the 80s when women were few and far between, and she has a real zest. I think that's the best word to describe it for investing and focuses on getting rid of the noise and knowing what to pay attention to and when, which I so love because I always want to know the how behind investing. Don't just give me the easy tips or the one, two, three, four. Tell me how you actually invest and prosper in any market. Mish spends her days at marketgage.com and teaches all things trading and even writes a daily blog called Mish's Market Minute Daily. And in 2018, Mish won an award for best stock pick at realvision.com. So yeah, she kind of knows what she's doing. And she's got a new book out called Plant Your Money Tree that I read cover to cover in one weekend. And now it has a permanent place on my bookshelf. So I wanted to know with all the noise out there, how do you know what to pay attention to and what to just turn away from? Mish, I am so excited to have you join us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, such a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited as well, Shanna. Fantastic. So I wanted to start out with a a sort of a loaded question. You know, there's so much noise with the stock market. Uh, As we currently are speaking, it is in decline. A lot of people are nervous. But how do we know what to pay attention to and what just to turn our heads away from? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and there's many different levels of an answer. So let's start with the fact that the noise level has been palpable, considering how much social media there is out there. So not only do you have the regular channels of 24-7 loops of news, then you have you know Twitter, LinkedIn, so, uh, social media, and Instagram, et cetera, although Instagram sure. probably least uh, influential in terms of more of what's happening in the markets and, and in politics, which are very closely connected. So what you really need is, and I say you, I mean everyone needs, is a way to be able to filter all of that noise out. And that is the whole reason why I wrote this book. So um, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit because that to me is the way out. I, I, I'm i practicing what I preach. I've been doing the same sort of thing for years and years and years. I've been in this business for a long time. 
But I also had a couple of other uh, things that really made me uniquely qualified to talk about this. I was a special ed teacher for a long time. And when I wasn't actually in classrooms, I was consulting throughout school districts in the United States on exactly how to modify curriculum. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, of course, my audience was at that point kids specifically with disabilities. But what it really got me thinking about was how do you pull out the essential kernels of something as a as the economy and Wall Street and make that accessible to the Main Street population. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail right on the head because I think I hear from a lot of friends, a lot of listeners that they just don't even know what to, you know, I keep repeating this, but but like what to pay attention to because there is so much in front of them every day all day long. And what we tend to see is the sensationalized headlines that everything's bad or (laughs) this person said this or this person said that. And so I think there is this real fear of getting deeper into investing that that suddenly they're going to wake up and they're going to have one of those like 2008, 2009 moments where everything has vaporized for them. Well, and and generationally, the millennial generation is actually much more aware of this than, say, the Gen X or the baby boomer generation. So that's a good thing. I mean, that's that's an absolute a good thing, because, you know, what I've read is statistically, most millennials do not look at passive investing, which means buy and hold. They're looking at more active type investings where, you know, they may have a little bit of a a pie in the sky outlook in terms of what their returns should be in the stock market every year, but they're looking at those returns more in and out as opposed to I'm going to buy, say, Apple and put it away forever because even if it goes 50% against me, it's going to come back. And that I'm very happy to see. So, you know, before we get into the negatives about what the millennials are going through, I will say a couple of positives. So one is that. Two is that you are actually, and I say you because I know you're millennial generation, are the richest generation that we've had and the most educated generation that we've had. Yes. So what I'm hoping for is that on the flip side of that, which is one in 15 kids with college debt actually consider suicide. Wow. I know I had sent you an article today that talked about not only the depression that people have because they weigh themselves on how they're perceived in social media, but also they're not saving any money. So, you know, you've got all of this, put this together, and what do you have? You have a generation that really needs this type of education. And since they're willing to get themselves educated, that could really help them and make, have them make money, even if things go from bad to worse. Yeah. And you mentioned this, uh, this article from Market Watch. I'm going to put it in the, in the show notes here, a link if someone wants to read it, but it talks about how social media is, is they say, quote unquote, the dark reason that so many millennials are miserable and broke. So are, are there any tips or strategies or, or just thoughts you can parlay on us of how we can be involved in social media, but maybe not let it, determine everything we buy or everything we do or don't do, especially when it comes to to personal finance? Well, yes. Okay. So number one is, you know, there is a philosophy that has been around for a very long time, which is buy what you know, not yes. necessarily what somebody else knows, but what you know. And so what does that mean? I mean, that could be a product. Like, for example, I had bought my niece uh, a few years ago, a GoPro camera. And that got me interested in what the stock was doing. Or it could be not just a particular product or a particular store or something like this or something more in cannabis, which, of course, we know is very hot topic and will probably remain a hot topic for years to come but also some of these mega trends. So instead of paying attention to what your friends are buying on social media, think about what it is that is affecting your life. And then we'll try to figure out how to make money in that. So like, for example, you know, we just talked about cannabis. So obviously that's something. Yes. But while this market has been melting down, Bitcoin has been rising. And even though it is still not so easy to make money in Bitcoin, there are ways to do that. 
And I think as your generation gets older, alternative currency, not just Bitcoin, is going to be more of a thing. So, I mean, that's two examples, but also this whole idea of geopolitical turmoil. For I mean, sure. I, I don't think that's going away no. anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make money in those situations? So this is why I wrote the book, because what people need is some place to start, a foundation. So essentially, when you read these personal finance books, what do they tell you? And this is what your generation hears when you get out of college too. Save your money, budget wisely, and live frugally. (laughs) All of which are impossible, virtually impossible to do. And so I'd say, A, with the amount of student debt, which is approximately $1.6 trillion right now, The first thing you really want to do is try to figure out how you don't think in terms of scarcity, but that you think in terms of abundance. And that's a mindset. I love that. And and I'm a living, walking proof of that. So if I may, if I can just give you a little bit of background here. Yes, yes, please. Okay. So I was, as I mentioned to you before, a special education teacher. And why did I become a special education teacher? To please my parents. That's what they thought I should do. They said, you're a smart girl. Teach. I come from New York. That's why I just broke into the New York Queens accent. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, go home. You'll be home from time for the kids. And so I did that. And I was really basically broke. I mean, at the time, things have gotten better for teachers through the years. But at the time, I was making $9,000 a year as a teacher. Now, fortunately, I didn't have student debt. I worked my way through college and I went to state university. So I never took an actual student loan. But I did obviously not be able to barely pay my rent when I was living in Manhattan or put food on my table, etc. So I became kind of creative. But then what happened was I met this woman who worked for Merrill Lynch and she worked on the New York Commodities Exchanges. And I had never heard of any of this. I mean, my family was not the type of family that sat around the dinner table talking about our investments. We mostly talked about how we were going to make it through another week with the money that my father was bringing in as as a mailman. So when I went down there and I saw thousands of young guys, and I was a very young girl, running around <laughs> with all the, you know, the the, the ticker tapes yes. above, and the prices changing and all these different commodities. And I was kind of a hyperactive kid anyway. And I was single, not that that was a motivation, but it was definitely, wow, this is an exciting, this like looked like a, a party, <laughs> party where people make money. Yes. <laughs> so it was, it was the 80s too. So it was kind of a wild decade, but we won't get into that right <laughs> That's now. That's another episode. <laughs> That's another episode, right. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and Wall Street in the 80s. But anyway, so um, I got a job down there and it wasn't easy. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is I never thought in terms of scarcity. And because I was young and because the millennials have the advantage of being young, there's a certain amount of infallibility that's good to have when you're young. So what I did was I went down there knowing nothing with zero money, zero money. And my goal, this is why I'm saying get an education, was to learn as much as I possibly could, as fast as I could. And that's what I did. Borrow $2,000 to make my first trade. And I got going from that point on. So there's where A, the abundance attitude, the infallibility attitude, and the education that I knew I needed came into play. Wow, that's just like such a great story. And actually, I wanted to, to ask you about that too. And, and even just to back up to your parents telling you, you should be a teacher. And so that's what you did. And I think so many of us have that in us where our parents think we should be this or that. And we go into that career and it's a career that either we don't like or we're not excelling at, or we just don't feel like it's it's using our skills to the fullest. Like, how can we know when something is is a calling for us or maybe we're just following suit of our parents. And this is like particularly speaking to maybe the the younger listeners who are just rolling out of college and maybe feel some of that pressure. Yes. And so one of the things in the book really 
what it does is it talks about these six phases. And so what I've really tried to do is provide a compass. You know, if you can look at two needles on a compass and know what's north, south, east, or west, it's the same principle here. So if you know by looking at these two lines, and we won't even get into what they are right now, but they're very, very easy to look at, nothing that we haven't learned when we were in elementary school and looking on a bar chart. From that, I tell you what the phase is and what to do about it. And so it's the same thing when it comes to college majors. One of the things I cover in the book is what should I do with my life? Well, what's trending hot? And that's what you can determine before you um, decide what to major in or even if you major in something. I mean, obviously, I majored in education, used it for a while, but then went off to finance, which I had zero courses in. So there's a certain level of life experience. But the point is, that was hot in the 80s, really hot. And so what I would say to the younger generation now is what's hot and that's what you need to follow. Now, you could be thinking to yourself, is anything hot? (laughs) Well, (laughs) you know, right now things look like they could really start to deteriorate. Well, that's where the mega trends come in. And then this next part is to look at your skill set. If I would have thought of myself as a teacher only, what's the adage about teachers? Those who can't teach. Right. I would have been self-defeated before I even got going. But I thought of myself in terms of my skill set, fast study. Uh, you know, I, I'm very, I was an athlete, so very physical, able to compete on some level. I mean, obviously, as a woman, I wasn't really, really competitive in terms of the physical size. Um, you know, I, I, I like numbers. I was good in math, et cetera. So the point is, is that think about what your skill set is and not necessarily the courses that you took in college and definitely not saying dismiss what your parents have said, but think about it. That's what makes you happy. And you know what? Your generation also changes jobs. Like an average, yeah, like I think it's crazy average, like nine times throughout the life of changing jobs. So don't worry about it. You're at that point in time in your life right now where if you go in a direction that you're not happy with, you can change course. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future, too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away, and back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll jump back into the interview with Mish after an Ask Shauna, and this one comes from Alex. Now, Alex says, Hi, Shauna. I'm just getting into investing. I've been really afraid for most of my 20s, and now that I'm in my 30s, I figured that I've got to learn something about investing and get away from being so scared. My parents lost a lot of money in 2008 and 2009, so I don't want that to happen to me, which I know I can't guarantee. But I know I got to take some sort of risk with my money because it isn't making me wealthy just sitting in my bank accounts. I'm curious, what investing books do you think I should pick up? I want good info, but I want something that's not too technical, but something that I'll stay motivated to read. Thanks so much. And I love your podcast. Well, Alex, this is a great question and obviously ties right into this episode. And I'm excited that you're getting into investing. I know that it can be challenging. And I certainly struggle with the topic of this episode, which is getting around the noise and knowing really what to pay attention to. And I found going back like old school and reading some books really helps ground me in the fundamentals of investing. And for me, it really helps take out the noise. So I've got a few books that I keep permanently on my bookshelf. And whenever I get a little like crazed with investing or I get a little lost, I come back to the books and I reread them. I've reread some of the books I'm going to list 
if I'm going to be honest, probably like four or five, maybe even more times, because every time I reread them, I pick up something new or I'm reminded of something. So if that's you, if if you're a reader, or even if you like listening to audiobooks, I just think it's great to constantly review this information over and over again so you can pick out those little diamonds in the rough of information that really resonate with you because you're right. You got to grow your cash one way or another, whether it's investing or something else. If it's just sitting in your bank account, even if it's just sitting in your high yield savings account, it's not keeping up with inflation and it's not growing. And I think that's the, the common thread that I see with a lot of people is you're really afraid. And I get it. I, it's paralyzing to look at what happened in 2008, 2009. It's a scary thing to think about waking up one day and suddenly half of the money that you have in your retirement plan or in your investing account is just vaporized. <laughs> that's a really tough pill to swallow, but that's sort of the weird risk reward that we go through with investing and, and honestly go through with, with growing our money because a lot of the vehicles that we have to grow our money, there's some element of risk. And it's up to you uh, how much risk you want to take on. You could be super risky or you could be not as risky, but you need to be riskier than the money that's just sitting in your bank account. So hopefully that helps. You're on the right track. But I would say I've got three books that are on my bookshelf now. And one of them is is Michelle Mish's from this episode, her book, Plant Your Money Tree. These will link in the show notes if you want to grab the book. I honestly read this book cover to cover, just like I said, and I was like, ooh, <laughs> this is a good one. So then I reread it again on a recent trip. And I, I pick up so much information and she puts it in a language that is so easy to digest. And that's what I love because it's, I don't like the super technical either. It just gets so bored and lost in the information. So I would definitely say grab her book. Another one is Invested by my friend, Danielle Town. She's been on the podcast. And this was such a fun read because I didn't know her before I read the book. And I read the book and I, it, she's weaving in her story of investing in between how she invests. And it was just so captivating to me to, to lace the investing advice in there with her personal story. So I've reread her book, I think, four times now, and it's definitely one that you should grab as well. The other one is one that I've had on my bookshelf for years and years. It's called One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. And this was sort of like, if you will, like an investing Bible. <laughs> um Peter is sort of one of the quote unquote legends in investing. And there's so much information in this book, even though it was written a while ago, there's so much that you can use. But I would say if you're new to investing, like really, really new, and you're just trying to learn the language, a great one to have is uh, Broke Millennial Takes on Investing by Erin Lowry. We recently had Erin on the show talking about her book, but this is a great one if you're really just trying to get like the lingo down and trying to understand investing. But there are so many different books on investing, so really go to Barnes and Noble. I know we hate going to the bookstore, but go to your local bookstore and like just sit there and page through some of the books and like see how the language feels to you. See if it feels like a good read, something that's going to captivate you. And I don't think you can read too many books on this subject because it is complex, but I think you can need to find your two, three, or four books that you really jive with. And those are the ones that you keep coming back to. Yeah, that's such great advice. We have, wow, we have so much in common as you're speaking about yourself. <laughs> I'm like, wow, we just have so much. What was your, uh, what were you an athlete in? I was a basketball player because I grew up in New York City. And that's, oh. <laughs> so we played basketball and I played basketball throughout high school and college. So, um, yeah, which was a great skill to have when you were going down to the commodities pits where, you know, yes. they were, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but anyway, so let's just get back to these phases here. So let's say like right now you're, you're, you're first tuning in and you say, okay, I got my college debt, but you know, I'm probably going to get a job or I already have a job. I'm relatively happy in my job. And I know the only way that I can actually increase my wealth is still the 
the, to me, the last bastion of capitalism, which is investing in the markets. Right. It doesn't matter who you are. And what they've done now is they've made it relatively easy for people to get invested with very little money. And that's through these micro e-minis. So basically, all you need is 500 to about $850 to make an investment in any of the indices. And that means if you're looking at the phase and you look at that compass, you can determine whether you're going to be buying it or you're going to be selling it. And that's the other thing is we are a buying mentality, but it may be that we're coming into the season here where we have to become more of a seller's mentality, which psychologically is not so easy for us Americans. We like to be, we like to buy America. We like to buy things, but you can make a lot of money being short. And also there's something else to talk about. And that is in a chaotic world, what does that mean? So I want to pause yes. here in case, in case you have a question. Because I no, I just I uh, you know I, I read your book cover to cover, like I said before the interview uh, this weekend, and I, I was wondering if you could talk about just a little bit about maybe like what phase we're in right now, and what are some of the dynamics of the phase we're in now. Okay, well that's a great question, and and um, right now today with the market being down as much as it is from the tariffs. And here's what's happened. We've had this tariff conversation going on now for months and months and months. What's happening now is I think people are starting to realize that there isn't any really great plan in the administration in terms of dealing with the China tariffs. And where they didn't expect them to retaliate, obviously now they're saying that they will. So what has that done? We came in today in a bullish phase. Let's just talk about, for example, the S&P 500. Came in in a bullish phase, had this major rally on Friday, and now today is down 2.5% and went into a warning or what I call a caution phase. Whereas the diamonds, the Dow Industrial Average itself, was already in a caution phase and now just today went into a distribution phase. So what does that mean? That means heads up, guys, time to actually be somewhat cautious. And what happened in 2008, which people still have some post-traumatic stress about, <laughs> yes, is it was so clear this was happening. You could see the signs. Things went into caution. They went into distribution. They even went into a bearish phase. People didn't get out until the bottom when they had already lost 50% or more of their money. And people who didn't get out say to me now, and I hear this all the time, but the market always comes back, doesn't it? Well, does it? We, <laughs> I mean, we, in, 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 in the 60s, we had a 15-year cycle of the market going down before. Wow. Right. You, sir, baby boomers certainly can't afford to lose that much of their wealth, whether it be in retirement accounts of one kind or another. There's no money say, that you can going to get in the bank right now. And if things get worse, the Fed is talking about lowering rates even more. So saving money doesn't work. So A, you want to definitely preserve your capital. If you're invested in the market right now and it continues to go into these negative phases, and that's exactly how I show you how to look at that in the market, then you definitely at least want to liquid liquidate your riskier assets. But I said, you can still make money when things are bad. So what does that mean? Yes. Tell okay. us what that means. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we've talked about a uh, geopolitical situation, which has an influence on something that your generation and a lot of baby boomers even haven't seen in 40 years. And that's inflation. And people go, there is no inflation. What are you talking about? Global slowdown. But one thing that I lived through when I was a kid was that inflation can happen out of a chaotic situation because mentally and psychologically, what do people want when things are bad? They want raw material, something they can eat. <laughs> yes. Something, right? mm -hmm. They want to be able to fill their tanks with gas so they can get to work. They want to be able to have food on the table. Countries all of a sudden with geopolitical situation will start to hoard commodities. Now let's take the other factor in commodities. So far, and climate change hasn't really put a major effect on a lot of the commodities. But what if that changes along with geopolitical situation? So what's happened here, and this is what I want to tell your, your, your young audience, is that we are at a historical low in terms of commodities versus equities. A hundred year low in that ratio. 
So equities have, are completely overpriced and commodities are completely underpriced. So where do you make money? Where, where did I make money when I first went down to the floor? My first trade was in sugar futures. Then I traded gold and silver. And then I went to oil. So I cut my teeth on understanding that no matter what's going on in the world, these are the things that can actually skyrocket when times are bad. So I would say, look at gold. Look at some of these agricultures that have been beat up terribly. And then look at some of the soft commodities like the sugar, which is a great barometer of what could happen. Because if the Fed continues to put, you know, put their... Uh, idea or what they call the power flip. They're going to lower their rates. And the dollar, which very easily can go down, especially if China stops using dollar-denominated uh, currency when it comes to some of the commodities that they deal with, we could go into a hyperflation mode. And you want to be able to make money with that. Yeah, that's such great advice. And I think there are a lot of uh, millennials, depending on where they fall in the age spectrum, who invest right now primarily through their 401k or their Roth or their IRA. And so they're they're buying into mutual funds most likely. And I, I think there's a lot of confusion that, that listeners have over how much should I still be paying attention to things if I'm in three or four, let's say, different funds? Like, do I really need to, to care what's going on with, with the stock market, with the industries? I, well, I'd say yes, because the whole notion of what's safe will change. You know, let's, 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 for example, talk about bonds. The feeling in a lot of these mutual funds is if you're long bonds, you're safe. Well, what if... That's not the case anymore. Even if the Fed lowers the rates, if they spark some kind of a inflationary environment as a result, along with all the other factors we just talked about, are bonds going to be a safe place to go? No. So I'd say you really owe it to yourself to look at everything that you're in and make sure that you at least have an understanding of the phase. Even if you decide to do nothing about it, at least you have some level of information. And then you could be the one on social media telling your friends, hey, you know, I just <laughs> I just looked at my 401 and you know what, guys, my financial planner or, you know, whatever, my, my the job that I'm in just put me into a lot of bonds because they said it was safe. And guess what? I just saw that the bonds are actually going into more negative phases here. So maybe they're not so safe. Heads up. Take a look at your 401s and your IRAs and your Roths. Yeah, that that's great advice. And I think, you know, the beauty of of your book is just there is a simplicity to the complexity, which I enjoy when, you know, I think a lot of people are so just like overwhelmed. Like there's all these abbreviations with investing. There's all of these numbers. I mean, there's there's just so much going on that it almost feels like overkill to to a lot of people and can be stressful. And so one of the things I really loved about your book was just a simplicity around it. And I think you're right. If you can understand it from an educational point, at least you can know what phase you're in. But Let's say someone grabs your book, reads through it, you know, has an idea of these of these phases. What else should they be reading or studying on a daily basis? Should they be reading Wall Street Journal or, you know, ha what sort of awareness should they bring to their investing? Well, I follow a lot of different people on Twitter that I really like to follow. Um, but, you know, this is where now you're crossing into that little slippery slope of making sure you follow somebody who is, knows what <laughs> yes. they're doing. And that's a big assumption, by the way. I mean, economists, they're often wrong. Maybe not as wrong as weathermen, but they're darn close to being wrong most of the time. So, you know, you can look at the Wall Street Journal and you can read one economist or one analyst talking about how we're heading into a recession and another one that says with unemployment down where we are and the GDP numbers of the first quarter, who cares what's going on in the market right now? We're still in a very strong growth period. So I'd say you want to look maybe, but you still need to make your own decision. Now, I will say I write a daily blog every day, just saying. I do not <laughs> tell people what to do, though. Everything that's in my book is what I talk about, but I do it in my kind of fun way. I use original photographs every day. And because I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, there is a lot of color in this town. And I don't mean the nature color. I mean 
the people, yes. the people color. <laughs> so, um, and then I use that as a metaphor for the market. So, um, and then what I do is I talk about what I call my economic modern family, which I don't really get into much in this book, but it's the topic of my next book. So because I love, by the way, Shanna, thank you. You just gave me, I wrote this down, a great expression, simplicity to the complexities. You're that, welcome. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll trademark it later, but no worries. <laughs> just kidding. Awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, that that's what I'm all about is try to follow somebody that at least A, has a methodology that you can understand that's repeatable. That's the whole thing. And that's why my blog, follows the book. I'm not going to say it's time to get out of the market. It's the top. But what I might say and do say is, well, very interesting. While the S&P 500 was going to new highs a couple of weeks ago, my sectors in the modern family, and this is what I consider to be the measure, the true measure of the economy, like brick and mortar retail or regional banks or transportation, you know, trains, planes, and automobiles, were still weak. What is that? Something's amiss. You know, when there's not, when you have a harmonious family, things are better. When they start to have disharmony, time to pay attention. So I would say that Mish's Market Minute is definitely a place to go. Um, and, you know, look at the headlines. That's what I do. I'm trying to think if there's a few people. It depends on really what you want to do. If you want to be an sure. options trader, I would say get your education in options. Not so easy. There's a lot of nuances to options that people think, oh, I just buy calls or buy puts and I make money. No. Um, so there's some really good options people out there. One guy in particular that I like a lot who teaches about options, his name is Bob Lang. Um, know about position sizing. So there's a guy named Van Tharp who's been around forever. He writes a lot of books about the psychology of trading and also about position sizing, which means how many shares do I buy of something that I'm interested in relative to how much money I have. So there is, you know, so I'm giving you a foundational education, a place to start. And I say, become an expert in one thing first. So you have a foundation and then what interests you, you can, you can go on from there. Yeah, I think that is that is such great advice. And you're such a wealth of knowledge. I feel like we could talk for so long about so many different things. But I'd love it if you could leave us maybe with just one takeaway or one nugget that can help better our investing practice. Like, what would that be? What would you tell us? Well, besides knowing the phase of the instrument that you're in, whether it's something you like um, or, you know, something you buy or something you use, you know, using cannabis is A, make sure you understand what the phase is so that that will tell you, is it a good time to buy or not? And B, as I said, really, I think for your generation right now, I believe the biggest opportunity is to look at some of these commodities. And so I would say, look at gold, look at the agriculturals, again, look at the softs, think about the relationship between geopolitics and potential climate issues and where that opportunity lies. And then even then, just don't go in blindly, make sure you understand the phase. And if you ever are confused, by the way, I'm available on Twitter. I'm very, very um, open in terms of I answer almost immediately questions. I'm on it, I'd say 24 hours a day. It feels like 24 <laughs> hours a day. And that's it at market minute. So, you know, ha get a mentor. Don't just try to go out there alone. I had mentors. When I went down to the floor, I told you I had, knew nothing. If it weren't for so many different guys who took the time to teach me so that I had enough knowledge then to I knew where I wanted to go and what I wanted to learn, I would have never made it. So the same thing. Don't feel like you have to be alone. Don't count on your friends who know as much or not less than you. Don't even count on your financial people. Get yourself educated in phases and then find a mentor who is like-minded, somebody you can relate to, somebody you like, and learn as much as you can. Such great advice. Well, Mish, this has been amazing. Tell the listeners, again, where they can go to find you and where they can go to grab your new book, Plant Your Money Tree. Well, uh, it, it is available on Amazon. It's a number one new release in retirement planning, beginning investment, and business and finance. So that's great. Yes. However, right now, Amazon is kind of out of books, which I think is a good thing. I mean, we sort of sold out really fast, so they're getting more. So Barnes & Noble has it available as well. 
And it's called Plant Your Money Tree, A Guide to Growing Your Wealth. You can also even go to my publisher's site, which is Roman and Littlefield. And um, and you can also go, if you go to Market Gauge, that's G-A-U-G-E dot com forward slash plant your money tree, we make it so that you can not only buy it on our site, but we actually have a bonus, which is me giving you, uh, it's a $97 course, primer on these phases with, you know, it's a PowerPoint so that you can actually not just read the book, but you can see it in action with my voice describing that. Then you can find me on Twitter at Market Minute. And also, uh, if you go to Market Gauge, our site, you can sign up for my free blog, uh, which is Mish's Market Minute every day. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. And a big thanks to our sponsors that make this show possible. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. But before you leave, I want to empower you to embrace where you are today, the good and the not so good. And remember, nothing lasts forever. Just keep taking small steps every day and remember how awesome you truly are.